or tape, CDs, DVDs, or our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Saturday afternoon, November the 30th, 1985. Thanksgiving weekend teaching and deliverance seminar being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Peggy and Bill Goodson tell of the miracle of their marriage. Glenn Miller teaches on overcomers, the marked ones. Irma Miller, saviors and deliverers coming out from Zion. Peggy Goodson is going to come and testify for the Lord. I don't know how often she has ever done this, but I think it's going to be oftener than she has thought in the future. Uh, I'll introduce her husband. This is Bill. I tell you, we did, when we get in that van, we can't hardly wait to get here because we know we have a, such an expectancy in our spirit that we're going to receive something new, something new. But first, before my wife gives her testimony, I want to get, give you a little bit of what the Lord, the, the one word that I stood upon, I was 46 years old when I met my precious wife. Now, I do get emotional, and I'll probably cry, but that's all right. Because I tell you, I waited so long and cried so many nights for my bed for a helpmate. Been saved 35 years, and all those 35 years, the Lord gave me this one word to stand upon. If thou will wait, son, in due season, I'll bring the right helpmate. 35 years, I stood upon that divine word of God. If thou will wait, son, in due season, I'll bring the right helpmate. I used to leave, go to services and see the joy of the Lord just transform lives and young couples coming and getting married. My friends all got married. And I kept saying, Lord, when? When, Lord? When, Lord? And I, I must have asked that a hundred thousand times. But he always gave me the same answer. Son, in due season, if thou will wait, I'll bring the right help me. Well, this went on for 35 years. I kept saying, Lord, when? When am I mother? And my father, who's gone to be with the Lord now, they never got to meet my wife in the natural, but by the Spirit, by the Spirit, they're in the cloud of witnesses looking down, even this afternoon, rejoicing because he gave me the best. He gave me the best. <clears throat> I told you I was going to get emotional. But this story that we're going to tell is a true story. If not something comes from uh, watching soap operas and all that romantic stuff there, this is of the Spirit and by God. My wife was an airline stewardess for 33 years, Pan American and National Airlines. And you see, all the, 35, all the years, God kept her for me. But you know, way back a long time ago, God said I would marry a stewardess. But I said, Lord, when? When, Lord? Have you ever questioned the Lord? I said, when, Lord? I'm getting lonely and I'm growing old. When, Lord? He says, son, in due season, if thou will wait, I'll bring the right helpmate. And I was. I could have got married many, many times. I'm not so bad. I could have got married many, many times. But God, I knew that God had the right helpmate for me. But I used to cry. Oh, I used to go home from services seeing all the young people married. Going home and having children, and here I go home and cry and weep before the Lord upon my bed at night time. And God would always say, Son, if I would wait in due season, I'll bring the right helpmate. Forty six years I waited. We'll be married eleven years. We're still on our honeymoon. We'll be married eleven years, January the twenty fifth of nineteen eighty six. So this is a t testimony. How that the Lord brought us together, not only by love, but we're bound by the Spirit of the living God. It wasn't something that was man-made and brought down from a, a factuation or uh, uh, between us. It's done by the Spirit of the living God. As my wife tells you this afternoon, and you have to pray for her that God will give her the boldness, because she's going to weep also. 
We're very emotional because it's of the Lord. Anybody can get up and give a testimony, but listen, when it comes from within the Spirit that's down in there brewing to come out, then you're going to have to listen because every word that she's going to tell you is of God by the Spirit. Son, if thou will wait in due season, I will bring you the right helpmate. You were 46 when we got married. <laughs> you met me. <laughs> well, brother, brother Mella doesn't realize that this is the launching of this vessel. I'm a willing vessel, but this is my first time speaking in public. I've, it's always been a one-to-one a -one basis and over a cup of coffee or something like that because I'm, uh, I like to get, you know, relax and so anyway, this is my first time so you just have to bear with me and just let me have. <laughs> my parents and I uh, moved down from Atlanta to Miami, Florida in 51 and uh, of that year, May 51, I started flying with National Airlines and then of course years later uh, National Airlines and Pan Am merged. They got married. So uh, I, I was just flying back and forth and not, I mean, I knew the Lord. I mean, well, I didn't. I believed. And I'd say my prayers at night time. And uh, within myself, I didn't really know. But I loved the Lord at that time. But I didn't, uh, I was going, I was just flying my own happy go lucky way at that time. And in the late 60s, I began searching. I knew there had to be something more. There was a void. There was a void within me. And I knew that there had to be something more to life than what I had. And I started searching. And I was going from church to church. But when I arrived there, I left the same way. There was no other warmth it was just all cold and no friendless or anything and I thought well if this is what church is I don't really want that it's something else so I, I'm just seeking everywhere for it so that was in the late 60s and the early 70s so I went to Tulsa one November it was um, I think it was in 72 and I went to visit my sister and they were holding uh, prayer meetings every Friday night in their home and I was there for uh, I think about a week a couple of weeks I went to all the meetings and all the other uh, prayer meetings that uh, they were holding at different places and I realized that what I needed was Jesus in my life and when I gave my heart when I gave my heart to him I asked him to come in come in and I love Jesus I was given this scripture, Matthew 6.33. I'm just going to read it because at times I even forget my own name. <laughs> but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I had been praying all these years for a husband. But then after I, began, after I became uh, born again, I was praying for a Christian, spirit-filled Christian husband. And being up up in the Middle Ages, you know, <laughs> I thought that there weren't any single men around, and most of the men were, if there were any single, they were were married, um, divorced, and that wasn't what I was looking for because I'd been studying the Word and I wanted a a single, spirit-filled man or a, a widower, spirit-filled man, but no one that had been divorced and no children. Because poor, the poor babies are the ones that bear the burden. So I, I that after I re after I took Jesus, received Him, and into my heart, I started studying and seeking and searching the, the Word. And in May, I went back to uh, Tulsa and I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But that was the highlight. I mean, the highlight of my life was receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit and I was waiting on the Lord and praying for a spirit filled Christian man and one Sunday morning just before I was going to church the local church 
I was watching TV and there was this uh, advertisement about a certain church in Hialeah. And I felt the strongest leading. I just knew I had to go there. So I told my mom and dad, I said, we've got to go to that church. So the very first night we went, I met my husband to be. <laughs> he was up at the pulpit getting his music ready and he turned around. He came down the aisle and gave us the warmest greeting. And of course it crossed my mind. I thought, I wonder if he's married. <laughs> Later on, my mother told me, she said, I knew that he was the one. But she didn't tell me because, uh, well, I guess she thought that maybe I would uh, just run away, so to speak, at that time. I have notes here because, uh, I'm mean, even though I lived through it, I still, <laughs> I still forget. <laughs> After I met Bill, we, uh, we were just good friends. And uh, he would take me out to uh, box lunches at the church. And um, we just had a good foundation. We fellowshiped in the spirit. And August, one morning, the Holy Spirit told me to start knitting my wedding dress. So I kept putting it off. I thought, oh, oh Lord, uh, I mean, he hasn't even asked me to marry him. I, I knew that I loved him. But there was no sign from him that uh, he was going to ask me to marry him. And, but the Holy Spirit kept telling me to go and knit my wedding dress. So on August the 8th, I went down to the knit shop. And I told Natalie, and I said, I, uh, I described the dress because the Lord gave me the, uh, the style of the dress. And also the, the uh, yarn. And it was um, a beige yarn with a satin thread that ran through it. And it was called Halo. And she said, is this a wedding dress? And I said, yes, it is. But I said, don't tell anyone. Because quite a, two, uh, quite a few of the flight attendants would go there to knit. And uh, I didn't want them to know about it because he hadn't asked me to marry him. And here I am going to knit a wedding dress. And <laughs> it takes a while. <laughs> So August rolls around, September rolls around, October rolls around, and nothing has happened. And uh, I felt that we would be married in December. So I told the Lord, I said, well, if we're going to be married in December, you've got to do something about it. So the latter part of October, I went to church, and the minister was uh, ministering on uh, the Jericho, March of Jericho, the Jericho March. And I went home that afternoon. I had a picture of Bill, and I put it, I have a round table, a round coffee table, and I put that picture on the table. And for seven days, I walked around like a, um, a wall, around the walls of Jericho. And then on the seventh day, I walked around, and then I started praising the Lord. And I said, all right, I, I accept it break down the stronghold and I accept <laughs> so uh, November the 12th this is the latter part of October about the uh, Jericho March and then on November the 12th Bill came over and I he's from West Virginia and I'm from Georgia so we like the good old country food we had pork chops and turnip greens and cornbread and buttermilk and we sat down and we said the blessing, and then we took one bite, and then all of a sudden he just looked at me, and his mouth opened, and the Holy Spirit took over, and he said, Peggy, I want to speak with your father. I want you to be my wife. So I just sat there for a second, and I jumped up, and I said, all right. <laughs> He was at the end of the table, and I was to his right. So I walked around uh, to the, his um, left, and I looked at, at him, and I said, Would you like to kiss me now? Because all during the time of our courtship, it was just like he'd put his arms around my shoulder or hold my hand or kiss me on the cheek. But he never did kiss me on the mouth. He never led me on because... 
He, he's always, uh, we had, at the beginning when I first met him, of course, you know, you always exchange remarks about why haven't you married. And uh, we expressed what we wanted out of life. And uh, so anyway, he said he'd never lead anyone on. So he never did. So anyway, I, he kissed me, and we both stood there and just cried like babies. We were so happy, so full of joy to know that the Lord had put us together. That he made it. He was, our marriage was made in heaven. And I know that he put us together. There was that assurance, not only in, in uh, spiritually, but I just, I just knew that we were going to be one in, well, one in the spirit. So when Bill said, well, let's get married in December. And I said, well, no, we can't. I said, I haven't finished my wedding dress. <laughs> And he said, what wedding dress? <laughs> and I said, the one that the Lord had told me to start knitting back August 8th. He said, you mean you knew all this time? I said, yes. And he said, well, why didn't you tell me? And I said, I couldn't. I couldn't tell you because it had to be of the Holy Spirit. He had to lead you and guide you to let you know that I was the one that you had been waiting for all these years. And also, I had to know for sure that... He was the one I'd been waiting for all these years. Neither one of us had ever been married before. The Lord saved us for each other. <laughs> we went out to speak with our, my parents and Daddy. Uh, when Mama, uh, when Bill and I walked in, Daddy and Mama knew what was going to happen. And of course, they were all thrilled. So Bill spoke to Daddy, and uh, we decided that We'd get married in January, January the 25th, 1975. So the Friday night before the wedding, oh, a couple of weeks before the wedding, I had gone after my wedding dress because it had to be blocked and the zipper put in. And uh, so I went and picked it up about two weeks, uh, just two weeks before the wedding, and I didn't try it on. But I asked Natalie, I said, is it all right for me just to just place it over a hanger she said yes because it had been uh, hanging for a long time and it should be all right so the Friday evening before the wedding we had re rehearsal dinner and after my sister and I came home I said let's try on our dresses to make sure everything is all right so I put the dress on and the shoes and I was dressed just like I was going to be for the wedding and all my heart went down to my feet because the dress was two inches too long. And you ladies know that you cannot knit, I mean, cannot hem a knitted dress. Just turn it up, you can't do that. Because the uh, had the dress uh, was crochet at the neck and then knit, crochet in the waistline, and then knit on down. And at the bottom of the skirt, full length, is also crochet. So Nancy said, don't worry about it, we'll pray about it. He'll, the Lord will take care of everything. So we knelt by the dress, and we started praying. And the dress was hanging in the closet. So the next morning, uh, we went to the knit shop, and I told Frances, I said, the dress is too long. So she said, well, put the dress on, and I'll check it out. So I put the dress on with the shoes, everything, just like I was going to the wedding that morning. And the dress was only one inch. Too, uh, too long so Nancy said if you wait until this evening so the dress will be just right well you know how it is the 11th hour and <laughs> you know you I have I have faith because out of faith I went to the church to meet him faith and obedience and out of faith I knitted my wedding dress that I was going to get married but at the 11th hour like this it was very difficult. <laughs> so I said, Nancy, you know I have faith, and I, I know that the Lord can do all things. Nothing is impossible with him. But I said, I, I, just, I just can't. I just have to have something done. So Frances said, well, take the dress off, and I'll take an inch out of the waistline. So she did, and that evening I went back, that afternoon I went back after the dress, 
and it was just just right and the evening for the wedding it was a beautiful wedding it was an anointing wedding and many people were touched by that because there were so many uh, there were many Jewish people there from the nursing home that my husband worked at uh, during the week and then he would minister on the weekends but and also that he and I I would go down and help him because they'd always have a, a party once a week for the elderly and I would go out go and help them assist him so there were many Jewish people touched there and just before the um, the wedding march that I was to go down the aisle I asked my sister to pray for me because I always cry at weddings and I didn't want to go down the aisle with tears in my eyes so she placed her hand on my head and prayed for me so I I really just floated down that aisle my daddy and I just went on down I was so relaxed and all during the ceremony and when we were to repeat our vows I went right through without any problem but Bill <laughs> he cried through the whole thing and he almost didn't get uh, he almost couldn't say anything and the uh, minister kept saying all right Bill just relax now you'll be all right and finally he got it out so we did get married <laughs> several months later I told Bill I said um, I have some long dresses that need to be him because back then when we went to church we wore long skirts so we took all my dresses I had about five or six of them and the shoes that I would wear with each dress so I want you to know that each dress that I put on with the shoes was just right so I looked at Bill and I said do you know what the Lord's telling me and he said yes and he said uh, if you had just put your that extra measure of faith in the Lord that inch of my wedding dress had been just right for the wedding so that was he was telling me at that time that to have faith even at the 11th hour We've been married 10 years. It's been happy uh, years. We'll be celebrating our 11th year, January the 25th coming. And we're still on our honeymoon. And all the young people, or even all, everyone that's eligible for marriage, just to wait on the Lord. Because there's someone, that's right. Just wait on the Lord because there's someone special for you the Lord has picked out for you. And if you jump the gun, you've missed the boat. And I know, I know that God put us together. And it's been the most glorious, well, I should say 11 years because it's, it's coming up January. And each, each day, there's just more love and more respect for each other. More, to, uh, more today than it was yesterday and then the day before if we just wait upon the Lord he has just the right mate for whoever is praying for the Lord to give them a mate and just keep talking keep praying <laughs> because the Lord loves you and he wants the right mate for you that's all I have to say <laughs> Also, out of obedience, the Bible said obedience is better than sacrifice. And my wife was obedient, even though she walked around that table seven days with my picture on it. I, and I never, I never let her on like she said. I knew that God said, Son, in due season, if thou wilt wait, I will bring the right helpmate. Isn't that beautiful to know that God knows the future? We don't know about it, but He does. Not only did God give me a beautiful wife and a companion that loves the Lord, our first object of our life is we love the Lord with all our heart. We love the Lord with all of our heart, and then we love each other. Not only did the Lord give me a beautiful wife, but He gave me a beautiful another mother and father. My parents passed away a long time ago, but 
When I married into her family, I tell you, I got a father-in-law and a mother-in-law that I loved just as much as I love my own parents. Even though my mother-in-law is going to be with the Lord right now, my mother-in-law and my mother and my father's in that cloud of witnessing, looking down. And I know that they're smiling and they're rejoicing because we're rejoicing in the God we serve. Praise the Lord. Well, Peggy, that's the beginning. You will do that. You will do this many times in the future. That's right. The body of Christ needs it. They need it. The older people need it, and the young people need it, so that they can encourage the young people. The Lord is faithful, and there's more to marriage than just sex. That's what the that's the only thing the young people know about, because that's what they're taught from the time they start the school until <laughs> whenever they get married. And it's, and it's not the way of the Lord at all. I bless you. I thank the Lord that He brought you to across our paths, because we enjoy your fellowship and the joy of the Lord that flows out from you to the household of faith. Amen. Amen. I have two people last night that Brother Cook prophesied to that I have not given a tape to. One there. There's one more. Oh. No, no. That's it. That's it. No, the recorder wasn't running one, so I had to do yours separate. Wasn't it? And Lord help those recording machines, that recording, because I still haven't got it right, Brother Mac. It's still... Last night it messed up. The tape last night wasn't as good as it ought to be. Lord, you know we need somebody here to take care of the electronics here. You know? Uh, and we need the Lord to send somebody here to... Because, you know, the Lord, the Lord showed me a design for a recording, for a television recording studio many years ago. And to this date, there's no such recording studio that I know of in the world. And we'll come to that day one day when we'll, do, when we'll need TV uh, to record these sessions on, on videotape. And uh, we need a burden of the Lord on young people for that purpose. Lord, we pray yes. right now we're united together that you will give my oh, brother to answer that Jesus. couple Yes. Yes, amen. Yes, Lord. Yes, Yes, amen. Yes, amen. Yes, amen. Yes, amen. We ask you in Jesus' name that during the interim, until you move that couple toward them in this ministry, yes. will this equipment work in yes. Jesus' name? Yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This equipment shall work yes, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord rebuke you. Yes, yes. yes. amen. The Lord rebuke you. Yes, hallelujah. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. That message last night was a tremendous message. And we're going to somewhere where we can get on tape again, Lord. There might be Thank many you, Jesus. people to enjoy. The Lord rebuke you, Savior. Yes, amen. Yes, amen. Yes, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you, Jesus. The tape last night is audible. You can hear it, but it has a, in places it has a background noise in it that's caused from an overdrive that uh, uh, should not be there. Praise you, Jesus. Brother Max, since he's been here, has been teaching overcoming. Brother Cook last night taught overcoming. Yes. The theme of these services since the beginning has been overcoming, right. the overcomer. And uh, 
This afternoon we're going to look at what the Lord has to say about and for those who are overcomers. Uh, you know, the overcomer is going to end up being like David and his motley band. You might as well just as well expect that and not be surprised by it or perturbed by it because that's where the overcomer will be. They will be the despised ones. They will be those who are queer and odd. There will be those that most people will want to disassociate themselves with. But yet it is to those people that the Lord is looking to and that the Lord will use in this, the time of the, of the restoration of the kingdom that we are coming to and have come to. Just to lay a little groundwork here for this teaching this afternoon, let's go to Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22 and verse 46. And Jesus said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. So the Lord says that we need to be, to be praying continually lest we come into temptation, or lest we not be able to withstand the temptation that comes against us or that is put against us. And Satan will see that temptation comes. You can rest assured, you can expect it, and you need to be waiting for it so that you can turn it at the gate, because it will come. Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah 59. says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear you. Now I want those iniquities erased and those sins taken away so that the Lord will hear me. And here in this camp, in this camp meeting, these, these services that have been here, we have had all the different ramifications of deliverance. We've had the praise and the worship, the word, the joy of the Lord. We've had the ministry of the, of the Spirit by the Holy Ghost and, and prophecy and, and, and that ministry. And then we've had the ministry of deliverance. We've had all the ministry of the Word of the Lord here in these meetings. And that's the way it should be. We should have a ministry that takes into consideration all of the fivefold ministry of the ministry of Jesus. Verse 12. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. Lord, help us to know our iniquities. Iniquity is doing something when you know better than do it. That's what iniquity is. You know it's wrong, and you do it anyway. That's iniquity. <clears throat> In transgressing and lying against the Lord, and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. And there's lots of that in the land today. And judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. In our courts, the judges seem to be ruling in favor of the lawless instead of the law abiding. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. The Lord's been displeased that there hasn't been righteous judgment. But that hour is about to turn, and God is about to bring forth his judgment through his prophets. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Luke 11. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, 
as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth so as in heaven, so in earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted unto us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, this morning and this afternoon, we've had a session on forgiveness, forgiving those who, who have hurt and harmed us, that we may forgive them, that the Lord can forgive us. For the Lord says that unless we forgive, he won't forgive. So it's necessary that we have a forgiving heart and a forgiving spirit. Do you notice that one of the first things that the Lord taught us to, ta taught us to pray it was, in the disciples' prayer, was our Father to pray to the Lord. Thank, thank our Father, our Father which art in heaven. Praise your name. Hallowed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then... Thy kingdom come. And we're living in the hour of the revelation and the coming of the kingdom of God in a reality in the earth. Joel chapter 1. Joel 1, verse 13. Gird yourselves and lament, you priests. Howl, you ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, you ministers of my God. For the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. Sanctify you a fast. <clears throat> Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. The Lord is desiring those who will come unto the house of the Lord and cry unto the house uh, for the sins of the household of faith. He's calling the priest to come and lament because of the sins of not only the, the priesthood, but of the laity. That they come in a broken and a contrite spirit, in sackcloth and ashes, fasting and praying because of the sins of the household of faith. Not of the world, but of the household of faith. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 9. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north. And every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man, one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood before the brazen altar. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, or the church, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go you after him through the city, and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly, old and young, both maids and little children and women, and come not near any man upon who is the mark. And beginning at my sanctuary, then they begin at the, at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. And that's the church that the word is speaking about. But you notice that the angel clothed in linen went first. And he went and marked in the forehead a mark on those who sought and, and, and sighed and cried and wept and interceded in the household of faith for the church. But those who were not interested in the church in interceding, the angel came behind and slew. Now, we've all been concerned about the mark of the beast. We've heard the mark of the beast, the mark of the beast, ever since I can even remember, because I was born in Pentecost when I was a year old, my parents got saved, and I've heard, heard, heard that ever since I can remember. But I never heard anybody teach that we need to be marked with the mark of God. Marked 
those who are intercessors marked with the mark of God. If we're intercessors, we don't have to worry about the mark of the beast. I don't have to be concerned about the mark of the beast. All I have to be concerned about is I'm marked with, by God's mark. And I'll be that mark if I'm concerned about the household of faith. If I'm concerned about the degradation and, and, and all that that is inside the church. And then, as the Lord works and moves and the light of the Lord comes through us, then those outside the church will come in. But our first obligation is to the church. And then as our light shines forth, then the others will be drawn in unto us or unto the church. Revelations chapter 7. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now, this afternoon, I want to impress upon every one of us that we need to to desire to seek after the seal of the living God in our foreheads. So that we're not concerned with the hour and day of tribulation when it arrives and when it comes upon the earth. Because we will be covered and protected. We won't be taken away from it, but we will walk through the fire and not be burnt. We won't necessarily be out of the fire. The Hebrew children were in the fire. They were not afraid of the fire. Even if they lost their life, they weren't afraid there. We have to come to a place in this hour as we walk before the Lord, that we walk before Him, believing that He's going to deliver us and bring that which He has promised. <clears throat> Just as she made the dress, believing that it was going to be used, we've got to come with the same faith that, that the Lord gave her to go ahead and do that. See? We've got to come with that faith. But we arrive with, at that faith and with that seal as we become intercessors in the household of faith. Now, I thank the Lord for all of you who are intercessors who come here and who come here and pray and seek the Lord here of a morning and at prayer meeting and all here and, and intercede for not only for the services here and for the ministers here, but for all the requests and all that come through this place and those who come here uh, that are here even at this meeting yet who still need help and deliverance and restoration and healing. But it comes as there are those who cry and sigh at the altar in behalf of the household of faith. The Lord is looking for intercessors. He's looking for men and women who are determined to serve Him with all that's within them, and that the things of this world will grow faintly dim and have no meaning as we look to the glory and the joy of the Lord that is ours as we anticipate the restoration and the, and the, and the manifestation of the kingdom of God that is about to come upon the earth. And I want to be part of that manifestation of the kingdom. And those who, and, and I'll tell you another thing about those who are intercessors. They will also be those who know the word of the Lord. Because the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon them and they will desire to know the word of the Lord. And, and we're going to look at some more here in a minute. But to those who know the word of the Lord and those who are intercessors, that the Lord has uh, uh, rewards for. You're going to have to study and know the word of the Lord as well. You see, the Lord says that to rule and reign with him. And we've had the misconception by tradition that everybody that's saved is going to rule and reign with the Lord. That is not so. That is a not so. That's, that's a heresy in the body of Christ. You may all get inside the gate. And I won't even promise you that. You may just be part of the multitude that was outside the court. You've got salvation. But you have no right to rule and reign in the kingdom. Only those who make themselves and prepare themselves will be worthy to rule and reign. And I desire to be one that will have a right to rule and reign. Whatever it is, it's a, it, but I desire to have at least a portion in the kingdom. Yeah. In the kingdom. And not be one who sets outside the gate and, 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 and has to be ruled over. But I desire to be one that will rule with the Lord. Uh, Chapter 9 of Revelations. Pick this up again. Verse 4. And it was commanded them 
that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. We've picked that up three times through the Scriptures here. The Lord says those who have his seal will not, are not to be hurt. And we find just one place in Revelations where the Antichrist is going to mark, his, his, his people are going to be marked with a mark. I believe that mark is, myself personally, I believe that mark is the control of our mind and our thoughts, and I believe it's the control of our labor. Whether it's a literal mark or not, it may or may not be. But, but anyway, Satan is going to control, and right now we can see that he has a good control around the world of people's minds and, of people's, and their labor. The labor unions and, uh, and all the different organizations and the organizations that, that are teaching mind control and all of this, they have control of man's mind and of his labor. But the Lord says that to those who sigh and cry for the abominations in the household of faith, that he's going to mark them with a mark in their foreheads, and none of these things can touch them. In fact, it's a, it, is, it is a definite commandment given that they are loosed to hurt the other things but they cannot hurt those who have the mark of God in their foreheads. Now, let's see what happens to these who have this mark in their foreheads. Revelations chapter 2. Let's see who they are. Verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So we have... A right to the tree of life, the overcomer does. And the overcomer is the one who's marked with a mark in their forehead, who are the intercessors who sigh and cry for the abominations in the household of faith, and sigh and cry for the, for the power of God to move and for a manifestation of Jesus to be in the midst of the congregation, for the glory of the Lord to come and settle over the people and bring Jesus a, 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 a reality to, to their hearts and lives in, 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 amongst the God's people. That's the overcomer. Verse 11, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt in the second death. There we are guaranteed that we're not going to be part of the second death to him that overcometh. Verse 17, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone in the in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. So, we, we get a right to the tree of life. We get, we, we get a right to uh, uh, not be hurt in the second death. We get a right to eat of the hidden manna and to have a white stone that has our name in it, or has a name in it that, that is given unto us. Verse 26, He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. Oh, I thought everything was by grace. We didn't have to work for anything. That's strange. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. So those who are going to rule and reign with the Lord will be the overcomers. They will be the ones who have power over the nations, who will rule with the rod of iron and with the word of the Lord. Verse 5, chapter 3. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of, the book of, out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So we will be guaranteed that we're going to be confessed before the Lord, that we're going to be brought up and say, this is one of mine. Here, Father, this is one of mine. I'm bringing them and introducing them. Angels, this is one of mine. So we'll be confessed before the Lord and before the angels in heaven. Verse 12, He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And we sing a chorus about that, don't we? And he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven for my God, and I will write upon him my new name. So the Lord's going to write his name, a new name upon us, which is, comes from the Lord himself. Verse 21, To him that overcometh 
will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am sit down with my Father in his throne. I have heard sermons preached, and I have heard it taught that we're all going to sit with the Lord in his throne. Only the overcomer is going to sit with the Lord in his throne. Because you're going to sit there, because you're going to rule, and you're going to reign in the authority of the name of Jesus, and according to the word of the Lord, you're going to rule. We, we will rule and reign with the Lord. Uh, chapter 21, verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. Now there is where we're going to be partakers with Jesus on an equal basis and be inherit equally with Jesus. Inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. There is sonship. There's true sonship. As we walk before the Lord and we become overcomers, there is the manifestation of true sonship as we come into that place with the Lord in a manifestation of his power and his glory as we, and, and as we share in, in his inheritance and we share in that which is yet ahead of us. You know, I believe, in my opinion, that we are only the stepping stone, that, this, that we are only God's creation here is only the stepping stone to what eternity is, is going to bring. And I don't believe that God created a million galaxies or five million galaxies and a hundred billion stars or whatever they are out there, regardless. And I don't believe that God created those just to have them out there in space. I think that somewhere in the, down through the, the eons of time that we will go out and I don't know what we're going to do out there, but I'm going to enjoy it. If I have to go out there and conquer some of those, uh, some of those uh, uh, galaxies or whatever it is, whatever the Lord gives us to do, I will enjoy doing it. I will enjoy visiting God's creation. I will enjoy whatever he has for us to do in, uh, out there in that. And I don't think you're going to get bored with eternity because I think there's going to be so much for us to do that we won't have time to be bored. I know the time won't be any more. But still yet, you say, well, so I've, heard the, I've heard remarks. Well, what are you going to do? Play a harp? That will get tiresome. Or pray, pray the Lord all day? That will get tiresome. Well, I don't know that it would or not, but... I think that the Lord's got plenty of things that he's got for us to do when that time comes. That you're not going to be bored and you're going to have your heart's desire in the kingdom of God. And I believe the king, that this is the beginning here of the kingdom of God. This is the first manifestation of it here. And then I believe that it will multiply and multiply through the, through, through the eons of time and across space. As, as we go out to see what God has in the creations out there. But right now we're concerned with here and now and today. And today and now, God is looking for men and women to be intercessors who cry and weep for the household of faith, spend hours and days and weeks on their knees in the closet and, and in their bedrooms or in the living room, wherever God has for you to be an intercessor in your house that He has, that he, He's requiring of us to be intercessors holding up and interceding for the ministry, for, uh, for, uh, for the, the, the different works that God has raised up that we know about across the nation, around the world. That God has, is calling a people to stand forth, to be the hedge between Satan, to build that hedge between Satan and them, that, that, that they will be victorious in their life. They'll be able to be overcomers also, but he's, but he's seeking men and women to be intercessors who, are, who have compassion and feeling and understanding that there's a world that's lost and there's a, a church that needs God and it's backslid and it's an abomination in the sight of God and it needs, it needs intercessors to cry and weep between the porch and the altar in behalf, in behalf of the household of faith that God will be lenient with us and he'll bring yet again a mighty visitation and I know that he is of the power of the living God that the world shall know that he lives because he lives in the hearts and lives of his people and he sees a demon and they see a demonstration of the power of God move and, and as the word of the Lord comes forth and is spoken it is written it shall be so and the prophet shall say thus saith the Lord and it shall be so for the power of God shall bring it to pass as we come forth to minister the word of the Lord declaring that Jesus Christ is the one to whom we serve, and to him be the glory. Praise be the name of the Lord. Joel chapter 2. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. On his holy place, the place of praise. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. 
Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand, and it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, then but, but in the midst of the darkness and the gloom and all, a people that are great and strong shall rise up. And there hath not ever been the likes, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. So the army of the Lord is going to stand up. It's preparing itself. The intercessors of that army, they're going to stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord. Verse 11, And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong and executed his word. For the day of the Lord is great and terrible, and who can abide it? Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. And rend your heart, and not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent? and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, and call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, and gather the children, and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber, and the bride out of her closet. And let the priest, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare Thou thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Then will the Lord be zealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, the word, the joy, and the spirit, and you shall be satisfied. Verse uh, 27. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. I thank the Lord for all of that taking place in this very place, this during this camp meeting. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out of my spirit, and I will show signs and wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion the place of praise and in Jerusalem the place of peace or the church shall be deliverance. As the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So we're back to the remnant again. I thank God that there are a people who realize that the hand of God rests upon them, and they desire to be part of that remnant, and they are determined that they will be. Come hell and high water, they're going to be part of that remnant of God. And I determine that I will be, and I hope that every one of you determine that you will be part of that remnant who are intercessors for the household of faith, that you'll be marked with the mark of God in your forehead. And when the tribulation and trial comes, it will pass about and around you, but the hand and the angel of the Lord will, will cover you, and it will pass over you, and the smell of fire will not even be upon you. Well, we have to stand in faith, believing that the Lord is faithful to perform that which he has promised us, but it will be only to we who intercede and, and cry and be intercessors with a spirit of compassion and concern for the household of faith. Praise the Lord. Amen. Irma? Let's just stay right in this uh, atmosphere of the Spirit and uh, turn to Obadiah, please. 17th verse. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions, and saviors shall come. Last, last verse. And saviors shall come upon Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. How many of, here, of you know how you can be a savior? We have Jesus our Savior, we know that. But this can also be uh, 
interpreted as a deliverer or deliverer shall come upon Mount Zion. But many times when the spirit of intercession comes upon Glenn or I, and we usually pray together when it comes upon us or it can come separately, it doesn't matter. But uh, during the Vietnam War, one night in the middle of the night, Glenn jumped out of bed and he said, wake up, quick, we've got to pray. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, there is a, a soldier, a sergeant, and he told me the name of the street and the town where he lived. Uh, but he was in, in Vietnam, and the Viet Cong was surrounding him. And he said, we've got to pray or they're going to get him. And so we began to pray, and we prayed, and we knew his name even, didn't we? We knew his name, the street where he lived, and, and uh, the town. All I remember now, he lived on a street called Sunset. I saw the house you lived in and it seems like it was in Kansas, but I can't remember that either. Because the next morning we didn't even remember who, who we, what his name was or anything, but we realized that the Lord had us, to, had Glenn to wake me up and, and for us to pray together to help this man. And the other night I told uh, to our people here before last Saturday night, I told how the Lord caused me once to to uh, pray and to save a girl that was ready to commit suicide. We had a secretary between 1960 and 1965, a lovely girl, so loyal that you couldn't even believe that she wasn't a born-again, uh, spirit-filled Christian. It was in our publication business. And, and she was just a darling, and we all loved her. Our family loved her. We were all very close to her. And uh, when we sold the business in 1965, uh, of course, we didn't have any need for employees anymore. And uh, she went to work at, at uh, Aerospace, another aerospace company. Uh, what's the name of that company? Pasadena, anyway. Another aerospace uh, company. And uh, we went our way. And every Christmas, we would usually uh, meet downtown somewhere and have a dinner together, the families. But uh, in 19, I think it was 1970, we were in Springfield, Missouri at a full gospel convention. We were doing the book and taste table, and it was a year that Shirley Boone and her husband were there, and the Hunters. The Hunters had just written some new book, and it was a, a terribly hard convention because there were so many people and around the book table all the time. We didn't have enough help. And when it was all over on Sunday morning, we started back to California, and Glenn was driving the Winnebago, and his mother was sitting up in the front seat where I usually rode, and reading to Glenn a book that she had picked up off the book table that she was, that was good, and she just read it to him. It's a real funny book about this man getting saved. And I went back in the back and laid down on the couch to go to sleep, and I just fell asleep right away. And while I was sleeping, I suddenly saw the secretary of ours, and I knew she needed prayer, and I, I didn't write all this down, so I don't remember exactly, but I knew she needed prayer, and I jumped right out of bed, and I walked up to the front of the, of the Winnebago, and I said to Glenn, we've got to pray for Sylvia. There's some kind of trouble with her. And so we prayed for her, and I couldn't wait till we got home. And our little grandson had always, from the time he was born, he would be, they'd bring him into the, the typing room, and he always... When he got big enough to even turn on a typewriter, he wasn't big enough, but he did it anyway. In his stroller, he would always go around to all the girls in the typing pool and turn on their electric typewriter. And when it would buzz, he would just get this big smile on his face. And she would let him play around her desk up in the front office and turn, turn the machine on and off all the time. And he always called her Sylvie Doll. So we all called her Sylvie Doll. He couldn't say Sylvia, so he said Sylvie Doll. And that was her nickname, and we, we used it all the time. So I called her on the phone. The minute we got back to Northridge, I just walked right in the house, and I called her, and I said, Sylvie, doll, how are you? She said, fine, when do I come to work? I said, tomorrow, because <laughs> we had brought home enough work for she and I together. And, and at that time, we were just operating out of our home, our offices. So she came to work, and I told her I had a dream about her, and that's why I would called her. And she said, oh, that's interesting. And then she worked for us. Uh, we eventually got, a, got an office building, and she worked for us uh, until we moved here in 1974. And then uh, after we moved here, she came and stayed one whole summer and helped us get set up the files and everything. But just before we moved here, she, she said, I want to talk to you. Well, she could talk to me every day. We talked to each other all the time. We were very close. And she said, I need to talk to you. I said, okay. 
what do you want to say? And she said, uh, now, tell me over, when did you have that dream? I said, on Sunday morning. She said, what time was it? I said, well, I think it's about 10 or 11 o'clock Central Standard Time, which would mean earlier, earlier in California. And she said, well, I want to tell you something. She said, I already had the pills and I already had the glass of water. I was going to take my life. Her husband, who had be, she had put him through college. He used to work for us, too, as a proofreader at night when he went to law school. She put him through law school. He became a city attorney of Los Angeles. He came very high up, but he was tired of her and wanted to leave her. And she just thought that was the end of the world. They had two children, and she just couldn't face it, so she was going to take her life. We never know. When the Lord impresses on us to pray for somebody, why we should pray, but we just need to pray. Sometimes I can be sitting in my office working ever so hard, and all of a sudden that power will hit me of intercession, and I'll just begin to cry out in the Spirit and pray. And some of the, I, half the time I don't even know what it is for, and then it just lifts, and I go right back to work. And, and the Lord will lead all of you. If you desire intercession, if you desire to be used in intercession, He will lead you. Yes, we need that mark in our forehead, but it, you know, we, it takes work. It takes work to serve the Lord. It, it takes serve the Lord. It takes strength to cast out demons. Sometimes it's weakening to your bodies. But the Lord is able to sustain you, and He is able to make you an intercessor if you will let Him. He will. If you'll say, Lord, I want to be an intercessor. Show me who to pray for today. Now, you can say that in the morning and maybe halfway through the morning. All of a sudden, you'll see Brother Mac and, and Jenny. And, you, and you'll just see them in your mind's eye. And you can just start praying for them in the Spirit. And that will be just the time maybe he's having a problem with a student. And he needs wisdom. Or he needs somebody to pray and, and uphold him or lift him up. Or it might be a, a blue day. You know, we get these blue days sometimes. Whatever it is, Brother brother Cook, or any of us here, we have the most wonderful people sitting out here in front of us. You meet the most wonderful people when you come to uh, Lake Hamilton Bible Camp because they come from all over, and they all come for a purpose, to be helped, to be changed. When you come to be helped and you come to be changed, the Lord's going to change you. I could stand here and talk to you about uh, people that the Lord has guided us to pray for, people that smoked and we would pray for them and intercede, and, and they would stop smoking. They'd never know why they did it. Kevin's father is one example. Kevin and us prayed for his father for several weeks that he would quit smoking. And one day, he, he never calls. It, Kevin is from a broken home, and he never calls up Kevin. He never hardly ever sees his father. But one Sunday morning, he called up, and he said to Kevin, I, I've quit smoking. I just got up in the night and flushed my cigarettes down the toilet, and... Uh, and, and I quit smoking. You can pray about most anything around you. There's always something to pray about. And, and all of us, how many really want to be intercessors? How many really want to be sealed by God? We can ask the Lord to seal us in our foreheads. And, and it's not just a one-day deal. It's every day. Every day there is something to be prayed for. The Lord can use you. You may sit in your house. You may think you don't have anything to do for the Lord. And some women come and tell me, oh, we're so bored. We don't have anything to do. I said, well, why don't you read your Bible and pray? That's something to do. We should never get lonely as Christians. We have the fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit. We have our Christian friends. We don't need to be lonely. And if we are, then that's a, an enemy. Uh, coming on our territory that we need to demand to leave. And I'm just going to sit down now and however you feel to uh, conclude this service, uh, whether you want to pray for people or, or whatever. How many really truly want to be marked? Well, come up here. Let's just have all the brethren just pray for you. Now, I mean really mean business, not just everybody run up, but really mean business. We're going to ask Brother... That's serious. Yes, it is. Ask Brother Kirk and 
Brother Mac. We'll and, pray over me, and, that's, and we won't lay hands on No, we'll, we'll just pray, over pray that, that the Lord will make you an intercessor, that the Lord will uh, put that you mark. Know, we can't do it for you. We can't do it for you. I want to tell you something. The Lord holds you accountable for your oaths. Right. Mm -hmm. Serious. Mm -hmm. He holds you accountable. Better never to bow. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Mean business. That's serious. It's better that you never made a vow than to make a vow and then don't keep it. God doesn't play games. A lot of people played games with God. Played games too long with God. And they've uh, and I, we've all been guilty. I'll do this or I'll do that. And then we haven't done it. But God still holds us accountable for it. So it's serious. It's not something that you're going to play with. Now the Lord, the, the Lord is looking and has been looking ever since the beginning for those who were serious to serve him, who were intercessors concerned with the household of faith. He's been looking for them. He's still looking. And he's looking for those who are serious and who will be intercessors, confessing their own sins, bringing up the sins of, of, of their family and those about them, being intercessors in behalf of your pastor or whoever your prayer group leader or, or wherever you, you go and, and associate with. Or if you're the prayer group leader, then you're an intercessor on behalf of your prayer group. Or, you, or if you're an elder in a church, then you're an intercessor on behalf of the church and behalf of your pastor. All of us, all of you have a place of intercession. And then when you get through being intercessor for all of that, well, you can, be in, you can pray for us down here and for Christ for the Nations and for all Roberts and, and, and other places that the Lord lays on your heart. We may not agree with all, everything that the Lord does everywhere. We may not agree with everything down at CF and I. We may not agree with everything over at ORU. But that's not our business. You see, God's the judge. And if we don't agree, then maybe we need to pray. Okay? Because God has done a mighty work through these places and through these people. And just because I do something you don't like, Maybe this is the same way over there, you know. So we need to be intercessors and not fault finders. We need to be intercessors. We need to be concerned with the household of faith. That the Lord will get glory for his namesake. He'll get glory for his namesake. From all flesh, that all flesh will glorify him. Jesus' name. Praise you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. You know, seven days without prayer is still a week. You know that? And God is seeking for a man, Ezekiel 22, I believe it is, that would send in the gap and make up the hedge. And he's still looking for that man. It's not just one person today, although you're an individual. But God is looking for that corporate people, isn't he? To be that intercessor. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm just going to pray a general prayer, and then, and then you can cry out to God yourself. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, we come humbly before Thee right now, Lord. And we thank You for the ministry of intercession, Lord. We thank You for the One that intercedes in and through us, the power of the Holy Ghost. And Lord, without the Holy Spirit, none of us could be an intercessor. But Lord, help us to have that relationship with the Holy Ghost to have that intimacy, that communion with Him daily, Lord. And, Father, whatever plans that we have, Father, we ask that You would just uh, come through those plans, Lord, and just speak to us, Lord, in the time and the need of prayer, whether it be in the night season, day season, whenever, God. Father, You see around the world the hurts and the heartaches. And, Lord, help those that are standing here today to be those true intercessors, Lord, that will cry out to Thee, O God, that will intercede for the lost, for the, for the Christians, for those that are hurting, Lord God. Father, we recognize it's a serious time, and in the name of Jesus we lay hold of Thee, Lord God, and we ask that You help us to be those intercessors, Lord God, that, Lord, You help us by the power of the Holy Ghost, and we commit this message, we commit this time, this prayer to Thee, and God help us to be faithful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tirando bolsita bakura basandele bikita basandaya. I know where you live, saith the Lord. I know where you stand, saith the Lord. And I know your heartaches this day, saith the Lord. And know that I even see your loved ones, and I know where they are. And know that I, yea, know all things, for I am the God of mercy. I am the God of compassion. And yea, know that I desire to use thee, for thou art mine, and I am thine. For this be an hour and a day that I've called thee, yea, to this place at this time for this purpose, that you would intercede and cry out for the lost. And for those that are hurting, I say unto thee that this be a day of evil. This be a day of wickedness. But I say that thou can not only pray against it and stop it, but thou can prophesy against it, saith the Lord. For this be a time and a day that you must lift your voice and your eyes to heaven. You must cry out with all your heart. And in crying out, I shall be found of thee, and I shall have mercy upon those whom you shall intercede for. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. 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 Yes, I have ordained, I have ordained a people to pass, yea, even through the veil. I have, I have ordained a people to move into the Holy of Holies. And yea, thou art part of that people, if thou wilt pay the price. Thou art part of that people, if thou shalt intercede. Thou art part of that people that shall be marked by the mark of God. For my hand is upon thee this day. Yea, look not behind thee. For yea, I say, look unto me, the author and the finisher of thy faith. For thy God is with thee this day, and thy God shall take thee. Yea, he shall direct thee. He shall thrill thy heart with his presence. But know that there is a price. Know that there is a weeping. Know that there is an inner, inner, inner uh, uh, seating before God. And know that there is an agonizing before God. For this be a day that thy God to say to thee, cry. Cry and spare not to lift thy voice up to thy God, yea, as a trumpet, and thy God shall do the work. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, my God, my God, my God. The Lord said, if you'll pay the price, if you'll pay the price. In the playpen, everything is for free. Amen. The Holy Spirit, salvation, water baptism, and all is a gift. But after that, you get it by the sweat of your brow. On your knees, walking the floor, crying out to God, interceding on behalf of the household of faith, you get it by labor. A child is born by travail. Right. And there's a child about to be born in the land. Hallelujah. And travail is beginning to come forth. I shall bring forth the kingdom of God in the earth. Glory to God. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. And the veil that we're talking about here is your flesh. You've got to lay it down. Lake Hamilton Bible Camp is not a place established to build Lake Hamilton Bible Camp. Before this place was ever in existence, <laughs> and before Kenneth Copeland even knew what it was, the Lord called told him, had him call me one day to have breakfast said, I have a, wet, a message for you. And he prophesied that the Lord was going to make whatever he was calling us to, to be the hub of a movement that would reach. He didn't use the word movement. He said it would be like a, 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 a wheel on a wagon. And this place would be the hub. And out from this place, the spokes would reach around the world. It didn't make any sense at the time. But now it's beginning to. Hallelujah. I'm beginning to understand. But... What God has prophesied. Thank you, Lord. There's been many prophecies come concerning this place. Satan tries to continually tear it down. But I will not be moved. I will stand. This place will continue. And it will grow in the, in the grace and mercy of the Lord. And the word of the Lord shall come forth. And men shall know that Jesus rules and reigns. Amen. Because he reigns in the hearts and lives of his people. Amen. And that there's deliverance and healing and restoration. And thus saith the Lord, for it is written so. Yes. And, uh, and it shall be so. Amen. 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 Thank if you, you go back to be a lighthouse to the place you came from, the 
carry the gospel of the Lord, the, the word of salvation and healing and restoration into the kingdom, that men shall know that the, that the day of the Lord is at hand and that it soon is, is upon us. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Praise Let us pray. Lord, we come to you, and we thank you that we've not chosen you, but you have chosen us yes, and ordained us that we should go and bring forth fruit, and that our fruit yes. shall remain. And whatsoever we shall ask you in your name, you will give it to us. Father, we move now into the dining room area, and we thank you for those precious cooks and those that have worked there in the kitchen this afternoon to provide this bountiful meal for us. We are indeed grateful, our God, and we invoke your blessing upon everyone that works in the kitchen. Invoke your blessing upon my brother Glenn and Irma in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for this vision. Thank you, Lord, that you're working and moving through him to the fulfillment of that vision in the name of Jesus. You are building. You are saying you're the author and the finisher. And Lord, it's going to be a great finish, that which you have authored here at Lake Hamilton. So we thank you, Lord, for the refreshment and for the fellowship we can have around these tables in the precious name of Jesus. Oh, we love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. You're so good to us. We love you, Lord. And having received this love, we'll go forth and let it flow through us. The love of Christ constrains us to meet people and to minister to people that we'll be channels of blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. It makes me dance for joy. It's such a wonderful thing to know that Jesus Christ is the King of kings, the Son of righteousness, with healing in his wings. Jesus is the great I am. It makes me dance. For joy, it's such a wonderful thing to know that Jesus Christ is the King of kings, the Son of righteousness, with healing in his wings. Jesus is the great I am. It gives to friends for joy, it's such a wonderful thing to know that Jesus Christ is the King. Of kings, the son of righteousness, with healing in his wings. Jesus is the great I am. It makes me dance for joy. It's such a wonderful thing to know that Jesus Christ is the King of kings, the son of righteousness, with healing in his wings. Jesus is the great I am. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything, is there anything too hard for me? Is there anything, anything? Too hard for 
No. Is there anything, anything, anything too hard for me? Is there anything, anything, anything too hard for me? This is the end of this message. Our website is www. Lake Hamilton Bible Camp dot com and LHBC online dot com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you. Mm-hmm.